Welcome back, everybody, to this uh, edition of Hardball Talks. Hardball Talks is the podcast uh, all about the collision between life and sports. Today, we are doing a roundtable. Um, we are going to be spending some time discussing the uh, Metro East Prospect Camp that was recently hosted uh, in the Metro East and and want to talk a little bit about that structure and the feedback that we got on that structure and also take a little dive into uh, prospect camps overall and what athletes should be thinking about when they're participating in a prospect camp. And then also today we want to final, you know, in the back part of our podcast, we want to maybe highlight a few athletes that uh, succeeded that day and stood out and maybe share a little bit of why, uh, what stood out during their, during their workouts. So uh, first off, let's just do, we have kind of three representatives from Extreme Elite. And then we also um, have Casey Fair joining us. And he uh, participated as a college coach that day uh, with his role at Southwestern Illinois College. So um, quickly, we'll just do a little uh, introduction on what maybe your role was for the day and uh, who you are. So uh, I'm host Brett Swip, and uh, during the day I kind of supported some of the drill stations and some of the layout of the, the showcase and then also spent time with the college coaches, um, getting them to the event and, you know, spreading a little bit more information about who our athletes were and providing that to the coaches during the event. Um, Hunter, do you want to introduce? Yeah, um, I'm Hunter Hiskey. I, my role is essentially just – organize the event, kind of structure the, the layout of the day, make sure things flowed smoothly, make sure that every athlete got ample opportunity to prove themselves and uh, kind of just structured the, the scrimmage portion as well in terms of making the lineup and the pitching schedule and, and all that stuff. Perfect. Mason. My name is Mason Hale. I'm our 15U Extreme Elite National Coach. Uh, Coming into the prospect camp, I pretty much helped Hiskey with all the operation stuff. And then day of, um, I was coordinating with the college coaches, making sure that they knew who was up at the times, who was uh, participating in that drill, and then just providing a little bit of background on all of our guys. And I also made sure we had enough video to then get all of our tweets out on uh, X and making sure our guys were showcased in that way as well. And then Casey. Yeah, my name is Casey Fair, and I'm the pitching coach at Southwestern Illinois College. And my role was really just to evaluate uh, mainly arms. Since I'm the pitching coach, I was really hyper focused on the uh, the arms, especially the, the 2025s and some of the 2026s. So uh, I spent my day just kind of evaluating the flow, uh, watching the drill work, and then really hyper focused on that game. And we other, we had a lot of other uh, staff and coaches kind of supporting. You know, a couple that I'd like to highlight. You know, Kate and Parnell. Um, Hunter, maybe just share a little bit of, uh, you know, his support with technology and helping throughout the day. Yeah, it was, it was awesome having KP there as a rap Soto rep who could bring all of his technology to, to help coordinate batting practice. We got numbers and, and metrics on every swing that was taken during the day. And then he was able to set it up for the game as well. So we got metrics on every pitch that was thrown. Um, so that was very helpful by, by KP to, come out and, and kind of organize that for the coaches to see. Yep. Uh, we also had a uh, director of hitting and uh, performance. Jeff Wetzler came out. Um, maybe Mason, would you like to share a little bit on what you kind of saw Jeff uh, supporting of the day on the day of? Yeah. So that was the first time that we got our new laser timing system out. So we got all of our 60 yard dashes were all recorded by our laser timing system. So that was cool. We got like direct results right away um, to see that performance. Um, and then Jeff kind of br brought the energy as well, I would say, in, uh, the game aspect of things. He was making sure everyone was where they were supposed to be. Uh, but a lot of times in those situations is we're just playing a game, you know, it's in front of college coaches, kids kind of struggle to bring that energy sometimes. So kind of gets monotonous that they're working through that. So Jeff was making sure our guys were staying involved in the game, um, getting behind their teammates and just kind of showcasing that aspect of our program as well. Uh, and then maybe finally, Casey, what uh, what stood out to you in regards to uh, the various college coaches that were there? There was a good representation from the different sizes and divisions. Uh, what's What stood out to you when you uh, saw the college coaches in attendance? Yeah, what stands out to me is that there was good representation at every level. And uh, every level um, is a different fit for each kid. 
and every level is also looking at a, a different year depending on the mm-hmm. the rules so like i said like i'm a i'm a junior college coach we're very very focused on 2025s and just starting to look at 2026s and then you have like division one coaches most of them are done with 2025s they're really focused on 2026s and introducing 2027s so on and so forth so having a a well-rounded representation at every level is important for camps like that yeah it's great um, let's, let's dive into the structure of the day and let's just kind of go through the agenda and, uh, let's just ping pong this around, you know, what, what was the goal of that section? What was the, you know, what were the reasons that we wanted to include that section in the camp? Uh, let's start off with the day kind of began with the, you know, warming them up, dynamic warm up, uh, throwing, getting them warmed up. And then we went into individual work. Uh, maybe, maybe Hunter, what's, what's the indie work section? Why is that in there? Why is that an important part of the day? Yeah, I think it's valuable. Uh, maybe more so valuable than the, than the kids realize just because it's a chance for the college coaches to, that are there to mix in and see how coachable the kid is. Um, they get to see how they attack kind of the, the drill work that they, that they don't get to see on an everyday level. Maybe if they went to a, tournament or another showcase they don't necessarily get to see the intangibles of how a kid attacks a drill um which is important to a lot of college coaches they want they don't want to mess around with a kid that's going to show up and not be coachable uh in their program so that's a unique aspect that that we offer to let the college coaches hop in and actually do a little bit of coaching before they start the evaluation process so they kind of know more of who they're dealing with Anything to add to that, uh, into that section, Mason or Casey? I think it's a good opportunity to, like, for those college coaches, kind of get their feet wet and, like, immersed in the day. Um, a lot of times you go to these showcases and you just start right away with uh, evaluations, whereas, like, we give our guys a little bit of time to warm up, and then it gives those coaches a little bit of time to warm up as well as they're starting to get familiarized with kids they can see that, hey, this kid does something really well in infield play. I'm really going to hone in when we go to the evaluation side and, you know, check that kid out um, as well. So I thought that's always something cool that we do. Yeah, I really like the the skill side of it uh, for a couple of reasons. Hiskey hit on one of them, which was uh, you see which players are coachable, which ones can take instruction, which ones look you in the eyes and have good tone and are able to uh, to make adjustments uh, immediately in the moment. There's a big difference between saying, you know, looking someone in the eyes and shaking, yes, sir, I understand that, and actually truly understanding it and being able to make the adjustment immediately. So that's something important that guys want to look at. The second thing is, is bringing a human aspect to college coaches. A lot of high school athletes are timid. When it comes to working with a college coach that they don't know, or maybe it's a school that they're trying to get into, and it really uh, allows them to relax and get that relationship built and see, like, hey, they're they're human too. They're no different than your your travel ball coaches and these other and these other guys. So it breaks down that wall. And lastly, um, it, it can cause some affirmation with coaching. So having a college coach at a Division One level say the same thing that your private trainer's been saying it kind of just just hammers that home and gets you to really buy into that. Because if you've built a relationship with a coach over many, many, many years, it's just like getting coached by your parents. You get coached by your parents and then you have a private instructor say the exact same thing. Like, all right, I'll listen to that. If you have a, a private instructor or coach that you've known for a long time and they've been saying this over and over and over again, and then you hear the same thing from a division one coach, it just, it just hits home a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hunter, what was share with the audience kind of what was the breakdown of the skill section? So we had catchers, infielders, and outfield guys split up. Um, then we had skill leaders. So yourself and Chris Fair ran the infield portion. Me and Mason ran the catcher portion. And then Joe Wade and KP, who we mentioned earlier, ran the outfield portion. And then basically we just met with the college coaches beforehand and we kind of let them pick whatever they felt their strength was uh, in terms of what they felt they could coach the best. And they were just able to mix in. Um, we had a pretty good mix of both. We had some coaches there that went to the outfield and assisted with the outfield drills. We had some that helped with you and Chris with the infield portion of it. And then we had one or two coaches that mixed in with me and Mason. So it was a really good mix. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a section, you know, what kind of stood out to me during that section was college coaches were kind of building their list for the rest of the day. You know, they were kind of asking questions of, you know, how old is that kid, checking their list, checking the recruiting sheets that, that you gave them. And uh, 
you know, they were starting to put stars by names. And, you know, one one example, I was standing next to a coach. He was a Division One coach, and he was on the infield. And, you know, and he was watching a group, and he talked to the group about, you know, this kid, I'm putting a star by this kid's name because his footwork is really detailed right now. You know, and he was watching the small things that that young man was doing. And because he was doing those small things inside of a practice drill session, he now made the watch list for that coach. And now the coach was going to move on to the next level, which is, you know, how's he going to compete later this afternoon? Um, so I thought it was a, I thought it was a really good portion of the day for coaches to, to get their watch list built for the afternoon. Well, that's the skill portion. Uh, we finished that, you know, maybe around nine 45, 10 o'clock in the morning. And then, uh, we moved on to the showcase portion. Um, Mason, what was what were some of the things that were included in the showcase portion? So we started off, we went right to our catchers. Our catchers threw uh, pop times down to second base. We recorded their pop times. We recorded their velocity from behind the plate as well um, and got the catcher's video taken all care of all that. And then we went into our infield portion. Infield kind of did the same thing. Got a couple ground balls right at them. Got a couple balls to their forehand couple to the backhand and a slow roller. And then we also were taking their velocity across the infield as well, um, ca catching their numbers, kind of capturing all that so we can start building out their player profiles. And then we went on to the outfield, and the outfield kind of did the same thing. They did a couple throws from right uh, to third base, a couple throws from right to home plate. Uh, but it just gave a, gives those guys the time to showcase what they have. So that's where you're looking at the metrics of how hard they're throwing it. But then also we can check their footwork and um, all that kind of stuff, the little things they do while doing those drills. Also included in there was the 60, right? That's when we yep. – is that when we uh, took the subgroups of position players and uh, let them go get their 60s in and get those timed. Um, Casey, from a college coach perspective – you know, what, what is, what are you looking for in this section of the day? Yeah. The, um, the skill portion or the, uh, the, um, showcase portion, um, a lot of times you can tell within the first three reps of things that you're looking for. So you don't need, you know, eight, nine, 10 ground balls, fly balls, et cetera. You're going to know between the first two to three reps. Um, if that person has an outlier, um, something that you're looking for is movement patterns, like you said, someone who has specific movement patterns that you see as projectable. Um, and then you're also looking for what I, like I said, is an, is an outlier, good or bad. Uh, if someone's, you know, 60 time is way, way over and that's a red flag, that may be an outlier in a negative way. Or if someone's 60 time is, you know, sub six, five, that person's going to get a star. Hey, they're throwing across the infield at a certain mile an hour. That person might get marked down or same thing from the outfield. So looking for the outliers in both directions, but mostly looking for movement patterns at play. Let's start with kind of each subgroup and, you know, Hunter kind of put your player hat on for a minute, like, or yeah. coach, coach the players up. Let's talk about the catchers. How do the catchers showcase well inside of pop time work and velocity work? What's, what's some coaching points that you give them to, to help them showcase well? So I think it's just about um, kind of what Casey alluded to a little bit is movement patterns. So how fluid do they make their transfer look? How, how easy does the throw look down to second? Does it does the ball have good true backspin? Does it tail off or cut or does it sink at the end? Like does it have good true ball flight down to second? Um, and, and and like I said, does it does it look hard? You know what I mean? Like th are they rushing the transfer to try to put up a number or are they trying to make it as game like as possible? So obviously if a kid's standing straight up when he catches the ball, kind of that showcase rep that that a lot of catchers have in those showcase settings where they're just trying to put up the best number possible. That's not really what those coaches are there to see. They're trying to find tools that they can see a projection at their next level at, uh, essentially. So it's really about just making – it's hard because the kids are – they're so ingrained on they have to put up this number, they have to, you know, throw this hard that I think it's – that's not – that's misconstrued sometimes. Um I think the coaches are more so looking for how they're going to compete in a game and, and how their skill set's going to translate to the game at the college level. Anything to add to that, Mason, when you think of catchers? Yeah, I think, too, is like something I always look for is like, okay, are we throwing a 1-9 down to second base and it's three feet over our second baseman's head or is it 
you know, two flat, two one, right where we want to put it too. So that's something that those kids have to think about too, is like, yeah, I'm trying to throw this ball as hard as I can. I'm trying to get the best number I can get, but also I need to be accurate in the same way. Same thing like is when we're going to the infield. If guys are throwing it over the six by six net, cool, you threw it 89 miles per hour, but you're not on point. So I think that's something catchers have to look at as well too, is like, let's stay accurate and let's stay controlled, but let's put up our best numbers as possible as well. You were given some pieces of advice, Hunter, the day of to the infielders and how they can handle their showcase section well. Uh, what were some of those points? Yeah, it's more so don't try to do too much. Um, like, I don't need them. We don't need them fielding a ground ball and taking three shuffles and pulling down to first base as hard as they can. We want to see what their velo is in a natural way. Um, like, what is their throw across in the game going to be, essentially? I think there is some flack. What was that two years ago when Mason Wynn threw like 100 miles an hour across the infield and Justin Turner got all over him? Um, now, that was a bit different because that was 100 miles an hour and it was in a game-like setting where, where he was doing it with some fluidity and, and in a competition setting. Now, if that would have been 100 miles an hour where he took, you know, a crow hop and, and didn't make it a game-like rep whatsoever – then that's a different story. And, and I just kind of wanted to avoid that situation where they're just worried about the number um, because it is. That's why we mix in the, the forehand and the backhand and the slow roller. You're not going to necessarily get your best throw off on those reps, but you are going to see um, how's your footwork. Um, do you get the ball out quick and on time? And, and can that translate to the game? Mm -hmm. Casey, any college coaches perspective on, the infielders or the catchers when it comes to those moves? Yeah, I think just in general when you get to those skill portions is like every kid walks in there trying to be the outlier when in reality the outliers are just naturally gifted in those aspects. So like if you go there and you're not a 90-mile-an-hour arm and you're trying to be, the odds are that you're still going to not be a 90-mile-an-hour arm and you're going to be all over the place. Same thing with the infield. Same thing with the catchers. Know you know who you are and be more projectable as far as your movement patterns being super clean, uh, you being super accurate. You know, if you know you're a two flat catcher, be a two flat catcher with a smooth transition and you're throwing on the dot every single time. If you're if you go in there and you're like, oh, I'm gonna try to be a one seven five guy, odds are you're gonna throw it all over the place and you're gonna look sloppy. So just know who you are and try to be really really good at that. Mm -hmm. And um, then the outfield portion. Um, Hunter, kind of share a little bit of that. Yeah, so I kind of – I gave KP the reins a little bit on that. We we were lucky enough to have some machines out there to make sure we had consistent ground balls and fly balls out to right field. Um, we just kind of lined them all up and let them get two throws off to third base, two throws home. Uh, we were tracking velos on that as well, but also uh, giving the coaches to see how accurate they were. Are they consistently long hop or no hop, or are they – or are they handcuffing the the receiver at the back? Like, are they they air mailing, missing the cut guy, things like that? So that was another one of those deals where it, you you can't try to do too much. Sometimes you got to slow yourself down a little bit, make sure you field it cleanly. We had a few guys that tried to rush and let the ball go right underneath their glove, and and that's never a that's always one of the more embarrassing things in a showcase when when you don't field it cleanly in the first place. Um, so just making sure we had good clean reps there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I saw us kind of coaching up the outfielders, really helping them or encouraging them, you know, getting behind the ball, getting momentum through it, you know, staying in rhythm, staying, you know, making sure that they get some some good prep steps, kind of working through it. Um, Mason, anything that you saw with the outfield that stood out to you? I just thought there was like a lot of consistency, too. It was like they weren't trying to overdo anything. They were coming in. They were getting their reps. They were going back to the spot where they were supposed to start. You see that a lot of times guys, like, creep up, and then the next rep gets on them. They can't work through it. So they were taking their time in between reps, and it wasn't like we were throwing a bunch of rainbows into the bases either. We were trying to get on the line. We had the benefit of being on a nice turf place. So use that turf to your advantage. And then also that kind of sparked some college coaches' eyes just when I was sitting there having conversations. And they, they saw a kid throw from the outfield, and he looked at me. He's like, what's that kid look like on the mound? So it was a way for them to kind of think about the game as well of like what's coming up is like, Hey, I like that kid from the outfield. Yeah. He, his arms going to play on the mound too. So that was something that I noticed the college coaches were just looking forward to other things as well. Mm -hmm. 
Well, before we go into the afternoon, because we're going to talk about the the actual scrimmages here in just a minute, but before we do that, let's think about um, maybe some examples of guys that stood out and and why they stood out. So I gave the example that of, of that infielder uh, who was uh, used as a, a positive example by the college coach because you know he was working on the details of his footwork. Um, you know, inside of the indie section, inside of the showcase section. What are some other intangibles or other things that you saw athletes do well that maybe uh, lifted them up the list a little bit? Yeah, I mean, um, we had standouts in all the position groups, right? Like I know we had some infielders that executed every single rep to a high level uh, and their arm played. I know we had a couple outfielders who pretty much long hopped right on the bag just about every throw and, and their arm plays at, at the next level. And then um, – we had two or three catchers that, that were on the bag consistently and, and put up a similar pop time with not really any outliers uh, for all five reps that they got. Um, and then same thing with batting practice, um, guys that could spray the ball around, get the barrel to it, and um, were consistently hitting line drives and not necessarily the ones that had the one swing where they put up a, a high number, but the rest of the round wasn't, wasn't great. So. I almost skipped over that. Let's spend some time on batting practice. Um, that was uh, right before lunch, uh, before we broke, before the scrimmages. Uh, what was the structure of that, Hunter? Yeah, so every hitter got two rounds of six. I know it's not a lot of swings, but, I mean, like Casey said earlier, you can kind of tell in the first three or four swings with a kid if they move well, are they on time, are they sp- – so, like – that kind of digs into another layer. Are they spending time in the on-deck circle to get their timing? Um, You can tell a lot from those first three or four swings. Um, And and me and Jeff Wetzler, who's our hitting, hitting, uh, head hitting guy here, we spent a lot of time on just telling the athletes to slow down, make sure that you're spraying, spraying it around, using all fields that first round, using that first round to make sure that we're on time and finding the barrel. And then maybe towards the end of your second round, you can try to let it loose a little bit after you get comfortable and put up a number. Um, But that's, again, that's the metrics are secondary. What they're looking for is consistent ball flight, consistent barrels, making sure we're on time every time and that we're moving well and smooth in the box. What does a projectable BP round look like, Casey, to you? Yeah, I think this is the biggest part that every athlete gets wrong or this is kind of the make or break round. <laughs> uh, all eyes are on you. There's nothing else going on. All eyes are on you as a hitter. Um, I think a big mistake athletes make is they don't get their timing down. So depending on the showcase you're at, sometimes it's BP, sometimes it's machine. It's on different speeds. It's on different distances. And they don't get their timing down. And I feel like then they get blown up a little bit when they go into, uh, into their first round. And I think they do it backwards. They go into that first round trying to show off when really that first round should be about hit ability and barrel control and getting a feel there. I always tell, tell guys like first two right back at the screen, next two oppo, next two pull gappers, get a feel for all, all parts of the field. And when you come back around and you have that timing down, then show it off. Cause yeah, people do want to see the balls hitting extremely hard into the gaps or over the fence. If you have the ability to, ability to do that, sure. Show it off. But when you go into that first pitch and that's your only focus, it, it, it goes South. And if that first round goes South, then that pressure just added on in that second round. And then it just continues to creep in and creep in. Yeah. There's a certain maturity that kind of shows up during BP, you know, and I love the way you put that, that all eyes are on you and your maturity either gets exposed or it becomes, you know, another, another uh, asset. Uh, Mason, what, what were some of the uh, good things that you saw when, during the BP? Yeah, I think, Hunter kind of said, Hunter took those guys aside before. It was like, hey, go spray the ball around and then put up some numbers and get comfortable in the box. And so that was another thing that I sit next to KP. KP had the Rapsodo iPad. Um, and we had about 20 kids in the 90-mile-per-hour club. Um, now, some of those kids, they were consistently there. Some of them were just kind of in that zone a few times. But you could tell the kids that were consistently in that zone, they weren't trying to ever do too much. They were trying to just hit hard line drives. They were trying to backspin baseballs. And then when it came time to let a few eat, they let a few eat. And so I felt like they did a pretty good job of that. 
Uh, our 15, you guys started it off and I thought they struggled. Um, and then, you know, as we continue to get to the older guys, they just went boom, boom, boom. And it was like, we weren't missing a beat after that. So, uh, that was something too, like that. I kind of talked to our 15, you guys was about, this is your first day here. You know, this is your first time in front of this kind of showcase style. It's a low risk, high reward. You can go maybe get your name on a list or they might not know who you are in a couple of years. Um, and they're not really going to remember this day. So that was something that our 15, you guys had the benefit of as well. I just want to spend a couple more minutes on um, Casey. You talked about that idea of some guys go about it backwards. Uh, maybe just, just speak like you're speaking to a 15 or a 16 year old right now. Um, what, what does that mean? And then Hunter, I'd like you to maybe elaborate your perspective of that too. Yeah, I think Mason just hit on it too. Is if you're 15 or 16, if you're just getting into the uh, the showcase realm, remember the NCAA rules. Let's start there. So not until after August of your junior year can you even get like a commitment. So if you're below that age group, these should all just be about um, experience and having fun and just getting better. And like you said, and if, at best, get your name on a list, but you're not getting your your name crossed off. So don't don't worry too much about that. So when you're going into um, a batting cage for BP. Like I said, start super simple. Just find the barrel to all parts of the field. Worry more about your floor than your ceiling when it comes to like exit velo and stuff like and distance and stuff like that. Try to keep your floor high and don't worry about the 100 mile an hour, 450 foot bombs. Then once you feel loose and you feel comfortable and you go back in, yeah, sure. Let it loose a little bit. Don't be afraid to maybe swing and miss at one. You know, you've already proven that you've got control. Now prove that you got a little bit of pop. Yeah, I mean, our the the college coaches that were there that did like some of our 27s, the the most they said about the 27s was, "Man, I I kind of like that kid. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep an eye on him as we go for the next year or two. Like there wasn't any sort of, "Yeah, I got to get him on a visit and offer him a scholarship like on the spot." There wasn't any of that. Um so like Casey said, the, what was attractive about those guys is that they had a a very high floor. Um and just we did use a machine for our BP. So as much as everybody likes to think that the machine's going to shoot the ball out the same way every single time, the junior hacks do change speeds every now and then, depending on if you have a you know a good ball or bad ball fed in. So there is a, an adjustability element that if you get out of yourself and you try to do it too much, uh, it can speed up on you pretty quick because you know it, it can range up to five, ten miles an hour from a shorter distance. So. So it plays kind of like you're facing a, a live arm sometimes. So, um, you know, you just got to step in there, slow it down, take a deep breath. And if I had to do it over again, I think next next year when we do this again, I'd like to set up a, a TV with the rap soto projecting the numbers out so the college coaches could sit back there because I promise you they would have been glued to the TV and trying to make sure that every single rep was was consistent. So, I know Mason said that we had some 90 mile an hour guys, but I think the next layer of that was, were they 90 mile an hour once or were they 90 mile an hour when they're off balance a little bit? Like, do they have that in their tank? Are they adjustable? Were they constantly around the barrel? Did they have five out of their six swings every round uh, towards their peak exit velocity or did they just run into one? Okay, let's shift on. That was great. Thanks, guys. Let's shift into the scrimmages. So first off, uh, Hunter, you talked about kind of laying out the pitching and the structure. Maybe just to uh, give the listeners a little bit of overview of what did the scrimmages look like. Yeah, so we ended up playing, I think, was it 11 <laughs> innings? Something like that. Something about like 11 innings. I think we had uh, right around 20, 20 arms go. I just kind of laid it out and came up with the line, with the two lineups of guys that were – either uncommitted and older that kind of needed the most looks and, and just to guarantee that those guys got three or four at bats. Uh, and then we kind of had the subs be younger guys who could trickle in as we went um, and then struck, tried to structure the arms that way as well. Like our, our uncommitted older guys, 25s, 26s kind of let off the game. Um, when I knew all the college coaches were going to be there and be in attendance and, and have guns out on them and, and be able to take notes, just make sure that those guys get their 20 pitches um, and then let the 26s and 27s trickle in as we went along. Um, but everybody got somewhere between 20 and 25 pitches in their outing. We killed the inning as soon as they hit their pitch count. 
because we, obviously we weren't worried about we weren't worried about what the score was or how many outs there were or whatever. We just kind of wanted to see what each pitcher could showcase. Um, I encouraged them to show off every pitch that they had in their arsenal so that the coaches could get a look and, and a full, you know, a full view of what they had. Um, and like you said, like we said earlier, KP had the rap Soto to, you know, show off spin rates, show off velos on different pitches that they had. Casey, overall, the structure of the scrimmages from a college coach perspective, uh, do you like it? What's the, what, what do you like about it? Yeah, it's very similar to, to most of them, which is, you know, you have a guy come out every inning. Um, you uh, cap the pitches to 20 to 25 uh, because three outs can happen really, really fast or it could take a long, long time. So having that pitch count to be a part of it uh, makes it run a lot more smooth. Um, I like when guys show off their entire arsenal in their warmups too. I think a lot of guys will go like fastball heavy to get like some velo readings and stuff, show it all off before the first batter steps in. Because if you're, when you get in com competition mode, it's easy for five batters to disappear and you didn't throw your change up. So make sure you're at least flashing it before that first batter comes in and, and uh, show off all your stuff. Like this, he said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like that goes into it, it. Like you said, that's important to show it off because some coaches could see that as like a knock. If you blow, if you're blown fastballs by somebody, and then you throw a breaking ball just to throw it, and you speed the guy's bat up, and you give up a barrel. Like some college coaches could look at that, like, well, that was dumb. I don't know. He must not really have much of an IQ. Some coaches might understand that he's just trying to showcase his pitches. So it is important that you do it outside of the competitive setting as well, just so you don't run into that situation where, you know, you're out there to get outs ultimately. Yep. You kind of talked a little bit, Mason, about the energy of it. You know, I mean, I think that's a, an opportunity for people that are participating in the scrimmages to kind of separate themselves by trying to be intentional about keeping their energy, you know, kind of consistent throughout the game. Yeah, I think that's something, too, is like our first couple innings were just kind of like slow. Like they were just slow. Everyone was trying to get their feet wet. And then like once we got the energy, you could just tell how much smoother things were going because it was like they were comfortable again. Um, it was, wasn't like there was 15 college coaches sitting back there anymore. Our guys were just out there playing. Um, and I think that took a lot into us because then they started having their teammates back. So they got a little more competitive. We weren't keeping score, but they kind of were keeping score on their own as well. So that's something is a lot of us are, we have a competitive nature. We like to win. We like to, you know, get all those things done. And so that was something that those kids were like, Hey, we're winning this game five, four right now. Um, and I heard that a couple of times, so that's good to know that they like to compete and they're out there. What are the separators guys during, uh, during these scrimmages? What are the things the college coaches are noticing or what, you know, how are you, how are you getting your name to the top, um, when these games are going on? Well, I mean, it starts at the, it's, it starts from the earlier portion of the day, right? Like you get it, you get a star next to your name for doing the drills, right? And then. They watch you during the showcase portion and you have some tools that might fit at their level and, and you keep that star. You don't get crossed off and then you go in the game and you barrel up a couple balls in the game, show off some adjustability, bust it down the line, back up throws, play the game hard. Um, don't necessarily treat it like you're out there just to showcase your tools. Treat it, you know, and, like a game and, and play hard and try to play a brand of baseball that you're proud of and uh, I think it's just kind of a wholesome, wholesome thing throughout the day that, that coaches evaluate from. Yeah, I also think that goes into like how you're going to deal with a little bit of adversity as well. Um, you know, you get your BP rounds during the skills portion of it and you can be successful. But once you go out into the game, it's you versus the guy on the mound as well in the box or it's you on the mound versus the guy in the box. And so you're going to fail at some point without the, throughout the scrimmage as well. So it's how are you going to respond to that failure too? Are you going to be a kid that goes 0 for 3 and you barrel up a couple balls and, you know, it's, it is what it is? Or are you going to be a kid that goes 0 for 3 and doesn't hustle out a drop third strike or do the little things right that coaches are going to see, hey, that's how that guy responds to failure. So I think it's also an opportunity that if you do fail in those situations that you can come out and, you know, show how you're going to respond to that failure as well. You know, if I'll speak on it for the uh, the pitchers, um, what we're looking for is guys who can prove to get out at our perspective level. And that looks a lot different for every single kid. 
Um, the big one is obviously Velo. Everyone wants Velo, but Velo looks different to every single level. You know, Division One's not you know 90, 95 plus. You know, so on and so forth. Um, after Velo, you're looking for a plus pitch, so something you can spin and locate really, really well. You're looking for a high strike percentage. You're looking for controlling the run game, so on and so forth. So making sure that you at least have one of those. You may not be a 90s guy, and that's not that's not a problem. But you throw a lot of strikes at 84, and you can really, really spin it at any time with your with your slider. That's attractive. Or you have a really plus changeup. That's attractive. Um, you throw 90% strikes. That's, that's that's attractive, okay? So just make sure you have something that uh, makes you stand out in the crowd that proves to get outs at that perspective level. Awesome. Well, that's kind of the that's kind of what the prospect camp was. That's the structure. Uh, that's the day. Um, I, I'd like to kind of finish this off for a few minutes here and, <clears throat> excuse me, talk about winners of the day. And maybe we'll just go around and, uh, you know, let's pick a guy. Pick a guy that you felt like, you know, had a good day. Why did he have a good day? What were some of the intangibles that he showcased, the tangibles? Um, let's, uh, let's, let's go around. So, Hunter, you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit of catcher bias, but Max Grimmie, uh, he's one of our Springfield kids. I thought he, I thought he showed fantastic. He had a one eight four pop time. Uh, I think he was 80 miles an hour arm. Uh, Showcased well at his secondary position, which was third base. Uh, really, really good round of BP. Probably one of the more impressive rounds of BP of the day. Was r- hitting lasers all over the field in his first round, and then you know lost a couple there at the end when he when he tried to go for that number after he had already put on a really good show and he hit some hit some homers over the fence. And I think that was just a cherry on top to his showcase portion. And then in the game, he he stepped it up. He did a really good job handling the pitchers that he was given, I thought. Um, called a really good game, kept everything in front, received it well. Uh, I think he had a couple of hits during the game. But he did a lot of little things right. Like I was I was talking to Mason about this off camera, that I wish we had a camera on him the whole day. Uh, he was backing up every base when he was playing third base. Like I, there was a, some pickoff attempts to first base. And, you know, it's a, it's a showcase game. Nobody's really – that worried about the wins and losses. And I see the throwback from first base to the pitcher and Max is right there behind the pitcher backing it up. It's like little things like that go a long way. Um, and he even took a beating back behind the plate and kind of just shook it off and kept going. So um, I thought he, he, he was really impressive to me. Yeah. College coach uh, mentioned uh, him during the live section, you know, how he was receiving the pitchers. And not just in his, you know, the skill set, but the the verbals that he was giving the pitchers, you know, in between pitches, you know, how they were missing, where they were missing, encouragement, just had a great feel for even, you know, we let the catchers call balls and strikes. And sometimes that can slow the game down, slow it down when you got a catcher that's, you know, not uh, not being directive or, or communicative. And, uh, you know, the college coach noticed that, you know, Max just really stood out in, in that arena as well. Mason, you want to pick a guy? Yeah, I think for me, uh, kind of someone who's first time me seeing him. Uh, he's new to our program this year. It was Logan Faust, um, an 18U kid for us. Um, he ran a sub-760. Um, he was barreling balls in his BP session. And then he got on the mound, and he was working multiple pitches. Um, a left-handed pitcher that was just moving the ball around well. And you could tell a lot of those coaches were kind of intrigued. They started looking at, like, okay, is this a kid that – we bring in and he could be a two-way guy that we start him out in the outfield. He finds his home there. He finds his home uh, on the mound. So he was a kid for me. I hadn't seen him before. Um, it just really impressed me throughout the day um, in all aspects of it and uh, kind of put his name on my radar as well. Casey? Yeah, for me, it was the, uh, the first pitcher of the day, which was uh, Sawyer Brunson. 2025 from Triad um, did so well. Actually earned him a visit. I uh, wanted him to come on campus immediately, and he was a guy who uh, he he topped 85, but he was consistently sitting 84. I don't think he threw a pitch below 83. It's nothing that's uh, incredibly impressive with velocity in this day and age, but his perceived velocity was very high. And what I mean by that is he was throwing 83, 84, but his the swings that he was getting on his fastball looked like he was throwing 87, 88. So mm-hmm. that perceived velocity, it, it matters. And then um, through a, a lot of strikes, high percentage of 
strikes and was able to spin his slider in and out of the zone whenever he wanted to. So that also helps the uh, the velocity being, you know, 84, 85. When they don't know what's coming, um, that, that can look uh, – it can get on you really, really quick. So I thought he was awesome and, um, and actually got him on a visit. Yep. Uh, kind of staying on the mound, I, I, I'm going to give a winner of the day just for a little bit of a different reason. Uh, 2026 Tyson Philia uh, from O'Fallon um, showed great numbers. You know, I think he sat 85, 86, maybe even touched 87 on the mound. Uh, showed a lot of other skill sets, you know, in the outfield and at the plate. Uh, but I think what stood out most, and I heard it from multiple colleges as they were watching him, he gave up a couple early barrels when he was on the mound. So I think uh, I think he ended up getting bases loaded with no outs. And when you're when you have a sophomore or a junior that's on the mound in those situations under the spotlight, you can usually start to see some body language creep in, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, frustration or, or anger or whatever it may be. And, and Tyson's been working through that uh, to make sure that his mental game is just as good as his physical game. And, and I thought that, you know, he's made, he made, he showed huge strides on that uh, in front of a, a big crowd of coaches watching him. So uh, I think he ended up striking out the next three guys and got out of the inning with, uh, with no damage. So it's, I, you mentioned it earlier, Mason. It's the adversity and how you handle it. Uh, the college coaches didn't scratch him off the list because he gave up barrels. Um, that's going to happen. And uh, but he, it's he actually probably got on more lists because of the way that he handled that and the way that he responded. So that was a yeah. Was, I think with I thought with Tyson too. I think me and Casey were sitting by each other, and he gave up those first couple of barrels, and that goes back to like throwing all your pitches he came in there and i think he threw the first three pitches were fastballs that got barreled up and i looked at casey i said he's got mixed in an off speed or something and then he comes in he throws the oo breaker and he's right back in the zone and then the kids kind of didn't know and so i think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier it's like don't be afraid to throw everything he tried to get in there and if i'm a hitter in that situation i'm looking first pitch fastball because guys are going to try to impress with velo and so he kind of bounced back that way and it was very uh he wasn't he's not necessarily known for his secondary pitches but he won the day with his secondary pitches that day yeah i think you hit the nail on the head with with the body language brett that's an easy easy way to get crossed off lists uh, for college coaches is when you cannot handle adversity well because for most kids in any present moment that's the easiest the game of baseball is going to be for you you know we're showcase style there's no winner there's no loser if giving up a couple barrels or having adversity hit you, if that's too much for you and, and body language starts to creep in, how am I supposed to trust you in a conference game in a year, year and a half when things start to go south? You know, so that's, that's a big separator for us. So that's just an encouragement to kids out there. Like, make sure your body language is always strong. Make sure you're always hustling, doing those little things. They really, really do matter. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll give a quick shout-out. We, we talked earlier about 28s and 27s that were there, how it was kind of a low-risk, high-reward day for them, meaning that if they came and underperformed, it wasn't going to hurt their chances, really. Um, now, if they did show up and perform well, they were going to get themselves on some radars. Uh, and I think Augie Booger had a really, really good day, swinging the bat in particular, uh, he's a 27 from triad outfielder. Um, he was on the bag with all of his throws from the outfield. Now he didn't, he didn't wow you with his velos, but uh, he worked through the cut guy and, and had a long hop bullet right to the right to the receiver every single time um, within their, you know, arm's length. So that good throws in the outfield. And then his first round of BP he steps up and he's gap to gap, just hitting line drives all over the park. And then, um, finally there, his last round, he, I think he might've hit one or two out there in his last round. So, um, same thing. He was 92 exit velo, not the most impressive of the day, but he was consistently in those, in the low nineties, upper eighties, um, off the bat. And I think he had a couple barrels in game as well. So, um, the biggest thing with him is that he was listed as a sub and, and we went to the subs and we told the guys, Hey, it's on you to get yourself in the lineup. We don't necessarily have it structured inning by inning. Like you guys need to start mixing in and take some initiative and, and make sure you get your two, three at bats and, and get your time in the field. And, you know, he wasn't afraid to assert himself with the older guys and, and get in the mix and face some of the older arms that, that were out there. And, and I thought he had a really good day. Mm-hmm. Any others that anybody was, wants any other winners of the day? 
you know, I'd like to, I'll lift up uh, Carter Braddy's day. You know, he's another young guy, uh, 20, 27, I believe, from Effingham. Um, <clears throat> he's the one that I felt like just started the day, you know, and kind of built up to where he was peaking at the end, you know, and he kind of kept putting little stars by him because, you know, he was he was doing the individual portions uh, uh, well. And then he got to a spot where, you know, high-level coaches had, you know, stopwatches on him even when he was getting out. You know, even when he was getting out, they were trying to see what he was out of the box, you know, how quickly he could get through a ground ball in the infield. Uh, the projectability, really, the college coaches were just they, – they, they, weren't, they weren't crossing him off the list because he's, he's still young, but they were trying to determine if his skill set can be projectable. So, um, and he, you know, even a ground ball out of the box, he's sprinting it, and uh, a D1 coach has got his, got his, you know, stopwatch on him to see what he's doing, and, and that's a, another testament to the type of athlete and player that he is. All right. Anybody else? Anything else? Any other wrap up? So Metro East prospect camp was a great day for um, not only for the, the college coaches in attendance to kind of see what's coming up, what's in the pipeline, um, but also for uh, our athletes to um, one, some of those 25s to uh, get those opportunities still to play at the next level. And, and that's happened. We've got a bunch of them that are uh, getting on to visits and going to camps and moving up the list of some of the schools. And then, our younger guys starting to put their name on the whiteboards uh, to, you know, the one, one college coach said, you know, I'm going to follow that kid's team this summer. And uh, just so they can start uh, seeing what he's going to look like in that setting. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you guys for jumping on. And thanks, everybody, for uh, who helped in putting the event on. And uh, we'll look forward to hosting that again next year. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening to this edition of Hardball Talks.